Hi, this is Mark from Skywagon University, and you're probably looking behind me going, oh no, not another 182. Well, firstly, we're in the hangar because there's some helicopters outside from the fire they've just put out, and it's kind of cluttered and noisy, and I can't get down the road we normally are on. But we're working on it anyway, so I thought I'd show you the engine of this 182 because it's got a supercharger on it, not a turbocharger. So the main thing I'll talk about in this is the differences between supercharging and turbocharging, and look at this one. But also, this plane has got a lot of other features that we'll go over as well to kind of highlight the model year and options that you can put on the P's and the Q's and the R's. So other airframe things that this plane has, um, so if you've watched other videos about model year changes, you'll know that 1979 is the first year of the wet wings, so 92 gallons of fuel, no bladders. This plane has got a sportsman stall kit on it, which extends forward about two inches and is full span on the wings, both of them giving an extra square footage of two square feet of more wing per side, so four square feet of more of wing. Um, it doesn't slow you down, it's got quite a sharp front to it, it extends forward a couple of inches and there's no fence on top, and I'll do a video coming up pretty soon on all the different stall kits to clarify that, but this is the, probably the best bang for the buck stall kit. And it's on it because the guy who owns this wanted it to be able to fly very slowly but also be practical at high altitude cross-country speeds. So sportsman, it's got an angle of attack indicator which is on the dash and it's a holographic one. We'll show you that up close so you can see through it. Um, and also a major deal, it's got a BRS ballistic parachute in it. So if the calamity occurs and you're going down, you get it below 130 knots, rip the cover off inside and pull the chute and it blows the rear window out and it says right on here, danger, stay clear, rocket deployed parachute egress area. So it blows out the rear window and it rips a cable up that top piece to the main spar attach points and the whole plane dangles from the parachute and lands softly. It doesn't, the plane's not usable after that. But um, that uses up quite a bit of baggage area. So, I mean, here's the baggage area. So it uses up a little bit of the baggage area and it weighs, you know, 35, 40 pounds and it's got to be serviced every, I think it's a 12 year interval, just like in a Cirrus. But the baggage area in these is here and then here. So it's still, it doesn't use all of it. But if you were over some forested area or mountainous area at night with nowhere to land and it quit, you'd be very glad you had that. But the whole rest of the time when you're just carrying it around, it is a bit bulky. So that's an extra thing that can be added to um, 206, oh, I don't know 206s, 182s for sure, but you can have that put in. So it's got a stall kit for slow flight, a parachute for super slow flight, and um, a supercharger for going fast. So let's get up front and see that. So if you remember um, from other model year change videos, the U engine, the 0470 U, and remember 0470 is opposed 470 cubic inch continental, and the U engine is in the 1977 to 1986 182, so this is a good old 0470U in a 79 182. This is the supercharger, all this stuff. And a turbocharger, a lot of you will know this, but for anybody who doesn't know it, a turbocharger is a turbine spun by the exhaust blasting out of the engine, and it, in its spinning through a bearing to a, a hot side but not an exhaust side, there's another impeller that's sucking air in, driven by the air being blasted out by the exhaust, sucking air in and jamming it into the engine and giving it artificially high manifold pressure because it's being forced induction. But turbochargers are fed with oil that's high temperature down to a bearing. They are high, very high temperature themselves because they're right in the exhaust gas stream. They have turbo inlet temperature. They're up to 1500 degrees. You have to cool them on the ground and let them idle so the oil doesn't boil in the bearing. There's a lot of turbo maintenance on a turbocharger. But a supercharger is the same concept. Here it is. It's a spinning impeller, but it's driven by a belt off the back of the engine. And if you remember in the 50s and 60s, you'd see a car with a hole in the hood and a great big scoop sticking out with butterflies on it like this when you rev it, and a giant belt coming out like in Mad Max. That's a supercharger. So the engine drives a belt which turns the supercharger, which makes the power that the engine needs because it doesn't have any power, 
but if it doesn't have any power, how can it turn a supercharger? So there's a catch in it. The engine uses four, four horsepower is used to turn the supercharger to make the energy that it needs to run. So it's, it's like a perpetual motion machine, but the energy input is obviously fuel and air. So if you were at low elevations, you'd be using it at like 24 inches and the supercharger's barely online. In fact, there's a knob in there, you can turn it off and we'll go in and have a look. But when you're at altitude, say you're taking off out of Colorado, you can go to 28 inches of mouthful pressure with a belt driven supercharger and the oil in its bearing is not hot, is not pumped from the engine, it's self-contained. The system is cold, so it's, there's cold air induction, the supercharger itself is cold, you don't need to idle it on the ground. It bolts onto the back of the engine. This one is made by a company called Forced Air, Forced Air Motive in Colorado. And it's about $30,000 and it just bolts onto the back of a Continental like this. The air comes in here, into the supercharger, compressed, blown back out, down here, and into the bottom of the carburetor, just through the normal induction of the carburetor. So it's, you'd normally in supercharge an injected engine. This is supercharging a carbureted engine, so you're putting forced air in the carburetor, which would make it too lean. So, not lean, there wouldn't be enough fuel pressure from Cessna's own gravity from the high wing, so there's a fuel pump. So you run a, two fuel pumps for takeoff, and after takeoff, when you're climbing out and everything's settled down, you just turn one of them off. And every hour or so, you just swap pumps. So there's two very good, long, what are they called? Uh, continual demand fuel pumps on it. And we'll look at those on the other side. And we'll look in the cockpit. So let's see how it all works. But here's the machine. Normal engine, supercharger. And here on the right side of the engine, you know, firewall, Here's one pump, fuel line to the carburetor, other pump, so you just alternate them. Each one could run continually, but just for redundancy, there's two. If it's at high altitude and high mouthful pressure and cruising, and you turn off the pumps, it'll quit. It'll slow, it'll run out of fuel like, it, like you turn the fuel selector off. It'll just die, it'll idle down. So there is a manifold pressure setting for every altitude where it won't, where it wouldn't need the supercharger, wouldn't need the pump. So you can actually, you can taxi it on the ground without the pumps, but when it's in high demand, it needs the pumps. So always in flight, you use the pumps. So two, redundancy. And inside, I'll show you the controls for those. Let's have a look in there. So here we are in it, pretty impressive. So the boost cutoff pull knob here. So if you were flying, and you did that, the supercharger is now offline. It would be normally aspirated, normal 182. But you're still probably, you're still sucking air through a stationary supercharger because the induction system goes right through it. So that's on off. Up here is fuel pressure, always in the green, and the two pumps. We'll turn one on, you can hear it. Fuel pressure. Takeoff is both, and then in cruise one. And they, this turns, so it lights up. That's off, okay. So fuel pumps, two of them independent, fuel pressure. And then here's the fuel gauges, which are just digital because it's been upgraded. And then some Garmin stuff. But, and some two 275s, pretty nice equipment in here. But that is the main knob right there, boost cutoff. And since we're in the cockpit, uh, if you needed the ballistic parachute in the unlikely event, of that happening. Activation procedures. Turn off mixture, rip the handle cover off, it'll just lift off. Turn off your master switch and pull the chute at 130 knots and she'll blow the parachute out the back. And since I'm seeing it out of order a little bit but it's fine, here's the supercharger boost cutoff manifold pressure limitations chart. So at an altitude you choose the altitude you're at and you can see the manifold pressure you can get if you were to cut it off. So that will keep you on, on track with the power settings with and without the supercharger. But to get the real information on this system, I mean I flew it up from LA, but to get the real information on this system you should probably go to um, uh, Forced Air Motives website to see uh, the real specifications and the real, I'm just giving an overview on this plane. This is the angle of attack indicator up here. See, it's glass and it's reflective, so you're getting an image from there, projected on there. 
and as you change your airspeed it becomes red and green on this screen that you can see through which is pretty nice from that indicator out there on the wing so it's got a lot of stuff in it a lot of stuff in it a 92 gallon wet wing 24 volt 470 uh, 182 and since the cowling is off I've talked numerous times about the spec numbers and the TBOs on these engines but we can look at it so I'll show you what the 1500 versus 2000 hour U engines differences are we'll go out there so 0470 U's in 182's and 180's so 182's is 77 to 86 a Cessna 180's is 77 to 81 because they stopped making them but the U, everybody thinks, oh, I've got a U, it's 2,000 hour TBO. It isn't. Some of them are. So I'm going to, normally the cowling is on and I don't take it off to show this, but since this one's off, I'll do this now. On top of the engine right here is the data plate. That data plate. And in the superimposed picture, at some point, you'll see 0470 U written along the top line of engine model. After the U, there's a number stamped on it. That's the spec number. If that number is below 10, it's a 1500 hour TBO. And if it's above 10 up to about 26, it's a 2000 hour TBO. And this one, as you can see in the photograph, is a 17. So if it's a 17, it's a 2000 hour TBO. If you have a 1500 hour U engine overhauled, you'll get it back as a 2000 hour TBO because they change a couple of things. It's minor stuff. I mean, it's like oil pump and cooling vanes around the spark plug, little stuff. But not all U's are 2000. And if you look in the engine logbook, it'll say 0470U, and then people go, oh, it's 2000. But the data plate will tell you if it's actually a 2000. And if you want to check it without taking the cowling off, when the, with the cowling on and the air intake here, if you get your phone and you're cunning with a light, just slide it in up there and just bang a few pitches with the flash into the dark and move it around and then look at them and then zoom and you'll see it and you don't have to take the cowling off. That's what I do if I'm going to go and look at a plane because most people who are telling me that it's 2000, I go, are you sure? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. I'm really sure. Yes. And then I look and it isn't. So it's a good way to check. But that is the definitive U engine TBO data plate story. So this is Mark from Skywagon University just doing a quick overview looking at, a, 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 you know, I get in strange planes with superchargers. This is, this is the second one only I've ever had. Um, it's not a sponsored video, it just came with this on it, so if you're interested in them, just go to the website and you can have a look at the details of it. Um, 79182 in really nice condition with a lot of mods and options on it, so I thought we'd do a video. Remember this little thing from the previous video? There's another one, um, another video about this exact plane, it's an Aerion Lightning, where I was kind of standing over it, like, I love this thing, it's great. But um, we do these videos on all different models and types, and if you've got an interesting plane that you want to do a video on, bring it to me and I, we can interview you and talk about the plane. And then please subscribe. We've got a lot of people who are very you know, loyal uh, viewers and people following, and, and it's kind of baffling why we've only got 35,000 subscribers. Please subscribe and maybe share it and give me some tips on how to make that happen more because subscriptions are what make us able to do it. But click on the link for subscription, the bell for uh, notifications. And also, if we do podcasts, and if you've got an interesting story about flying or career, or you know somebody that might like to come over, have a cup of coffee, or do an informal podcast as well. But thanks very much for watching. Mark at Skywagon University.